Hello guys, can you hear me? So, good. Can you see over there in the far back? It's a pretty small screen we have. Uh, if you can't see, you should move forward. Uh, so I think we'll uh, start this session now. Uh, we're ready to go. So welcome to this session about TMS, so it's me, uh, and how to learn different options for uh, calculating freight charges and understanding allocation and reconcili reconciliation with the uh, carry invoices. So that's uh, kind of the high-level uh, uh, agenda for today. Uh, I'm Marcus Vogelbauer. I'm a program manager uh, with uh, Microsoft in Copenhagen, where we develop all the supply chain features for uh, Dynamics 365 for operations. And I have uh, Frank with me here. Yeah, hello. My name is Frank Dale. I'm also working out of the Danish office we have been working in the supply chain area of the application for, uh, well, going on 15 years. Um, so I've been around there uh, for some time. Both uh, from Microsoft, obviously. <laughs> yes. Oh, so we have, okay, so no agenda included. Uh, but we will uh, talk today about uh, a little bit. Uh, I will give you a brief overview of uh, transportation management. How many of here has been working with TMS before? Uh, so not too many that are familiar, and then I will spend a bit longer explaining some of the basic processes and uh, how that works. And then what we have planned for this session is to present two new features uh, that we have uh, shipped in with the fall release uh, that are relating to uh, transportation management. One is a new uh, 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 rating engine used for uh, uh, calculating estimated costs from transportation carriers, and the other is uh, we will show some integration with the uh, transfer orders uh, yeah. and uh, constraints and uh, and how that works. How to drive reconciliation with transfer orders that we enabled. Yes. Uh, so I'll uh, go through a, a quick overview of uh, the transportation process as we see it in uh, uh, Dynamics 365 for operations. So our TMS module uh, that we have is mainly aimed for uh, uh, con cons or consuming transportation service services from external carriers. Uh, so we are not focused that much on uh, on 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 customers or uh, users who are uh, having their own internal uh, transportation fleets and needs to manage for them. Uh, we have very limited functionality with regards to man managing your own fleet. So it's mainly aimed for uh, uh, the consumption of transportation processes and the. Uh, integration and reconciliation process with uh, all the core financials uh, that comes with uh, uh, with adding transportation charges to uh, source document lines and uh, all of that. So that's uh, and the planning process, of course. Uh, uh, so we, we we have examples to companies that are having their own fleet that are using the transportation management system available. Um, what we you may find there is that some of the optimizations of utilizing the transportation resources that some supportive capabilities are needed outside of the transportation management in that case. Um, yeah. um, so uh, what I said in the beginning phase is that we're, uh, we're using this to, uh, uh, the setup, uh, we can set up different carriers in our uh, transportation systems and we can map those carriers to different uh, ways of calculating freight depending on the, their services that they, uh, or the, the carrier contracts that, uh, that are available and that you, you have with your carriers. Uh, so from those carrier contracts you can map in operations, uh, those uh, rates, discounts or fuel surcharges uh, uh, that should be applied to an order when you uh, select that carrier. Uh, to be used. Uh, so that's uh, some of the uh, basic part of the setup. I will go a bit more deeper in detail with that when I uh, will demo our new uh, uh, engine that we have added. So I'll do that a bit later. Uh, for now, we'll move on to the next step in our uh, transportation process, uh, which is uh, the, the planning of uh, loads. We have this uh, concepts of load in the TMS and within warehousing. Uh, and that's basically used for uh, defining the trailer or truck or set of trucks that are going out from your warehouse containing uh, uh, the supply and demand uh, that you need to be included there. So you, we can plan loads based on the, the source documents on the sales order, purchase orders, or transfer orders. 
and we can consolidate uh, in different ways uh, uh, when we do that planning uh, uh, based on the capacity, for example, on the trailer that you use or uh, uh, whatever you set up there. So, so I guess there on that note, mm -hmm. I mean, the, the different routes you can take as you're looking at having a source token by which you need to arrange for transportation, you could say for that specific order, I'm creating a new load dedicated for the, from that uh, to have its own uh, carrier agreement made. Or ultimately, you can use the load planning where you have a set of documents needing for transportation, and then the load planning could help facilitate uh, coordinating transportation on behalf of a group of documents. Yes. So that's actually what I'm going to demo quickly right now uh, in operations. It's our uh, load planning workbench, uh, which is uh, aimed for the, uh, the transportation coordinator who is uh, uh, looking through when, a, for example, when, a, in a, when a, I will show some sales lines now. So when a sales representative have created uh, lines for sales orders going out, uh, those open lines will show up here in the load planning workbench to uh, be able to be used uh, in transportation planning. So they are not, if they show up here, they're not yet on a load. And we have existing loads in the system shown here in the bottom area. Uh, so you see I already have a bunch of different loads, uh, some going outbound and a few going inbound. Uh, and you can see the load status of them right there. And what we can do with, the, I have three sales order lines that are not currently on a load. Uh, so we can either we can select one of those and add them to a new load, or we can multi-select several loads uh, and add them to a new load or to an existing load uh, that we already have. So in that case, I would select one of uh, my loads down here that I want to add the sales lines to uh, in order to plan the transportation. So uh, we have some different options for consolidating and uh, doing this in a more efficient way. If uh, if you have many, many, many sales lines going out per day, for example, uh, you need to plan. Uh, we have a, a load building workbench uh, that is able to outdo uh, propose or automatically propose uh, um, loads based on the demand that is existing. Uh, so what I can uh, quickly show you here is if we want to fill, create a, you can set up different strategies if you don't want to fill up a load completely. Uh, if you want to load building work, bench to only propose uh, a certain capacity in the load in order to have some excess for uh, for later on putting uh, additional lines that are coming in late on the same load. You can ask it to only fill up to a certain percentage that you that is used to user defined. Uh, for this purpose, I will uh, just select the full load and I can add uh, one of my load templates. So load templates is a way for us to uh, create uh, a template of uh, containers, for example, here in our demo data, we have uh, three options for uh, one for 20 feet container, 40 feet, or just a standard load template. And each of these load templates have defined different uh, uh, capacities, for example. So if I uh, view the details of this, I can see the standard load template is allowing uh, uh, maximum load volume to be 10. So. Uh, it will uh, fill up only uh, uh, 10 in volume uh, on that one. Uh, and we can also define maximum weight uh, for that load. So if I use the standard load template and I click on propose loads, it will look on all the open sales lines that we have. And it will propose the uh, loads based on, on that demand and uh, the maximum volume or weight capacity of this, the load template. Uh, so what we'll propose here is actually uh, uh, creating a load uh, containing all three uh, sales lines that I have open uh, because uh, the volume is not exceeding the maximum volume of the load template. And from this UI, if I had more uh, sales line available that would exceed the, uh, the, the maximum volume of the load template, it would propose multiple of these loads to be created. Uh, so I guess this is similar to that the that the template indicate the size of, say, a truck. Mm -hmm. And uh, if what you are shipping exceeds what fits into a truck, then you need to have additional um, credits. Exactly. So from here, I can also uh, uh, remove a question. A question. Oh. Yes. So the volume of volume is considered as the package. So the volume is taking from uh, the, 
it's, yeah, it's taken from the released product, so whatever volume setup, not from the container uh, currently. Because I have a scenario where I might have, you know, item with a different uh, volume, but my container is a bit bigger, you know, yes. to accommodate yeah. that, and yeah. then I can put some, like, packaging material to make sure it's safe. Exactly. So, so we have a new uh, or a pretty new feature for uh, creating uh, container types uh, that is used in uh, our warehouse management module. It has uh, so far only been enabled for uh, inbound processing and uh, storing uh, con different container types with different volumes uh, in the warehouse. That's, uh, that's our first iteration on that feature. Uh, what we want to do in the future is also enable those container types uh, to be used in the load planning and in the outbound area as well, uh, but we haven't, we haven't gotten there yet. So that's on our roadmap. Actually, I'm, um, I'm using the 2012, 2012R3 version of warehouse management. Yes. Over there, I use container for the, for the packing, for the outbound operation as well. Yes, yes, the containers, uh, definitely if you use the pack station, those are there, but those are different from the container types that you can assign to a license plate as well. That's, uh, that's uh, more the way we want to control that one. Uh, yes? Mm -hmm. Make a proposal for what to be included, depending on the uh, Is it possible? Is that proposed depending on um, addresses or like depending on where it should be shipped? Or yes, that uh, that is definitely possible. Uh, right now, I didn't uh, use any of that settings, but if I go back to uh, this page with, with a, I can specify which customer I want to use or if I want to use a scheduled route, a pre-curated route that we already know is going in one direction or multiple directions, or we can uh, say different zip code uh, from and to. So that's possible to specify before you propose, and then it will only propose that. Uh, so. <laughs> yes, so I'll uh, go back to my post uh, load. I will do some changes because I don't want the first line to be included in my load, so I can click remove on that one, and then it will uh, be picked up here in the not included one. So you you can, if you have multiple here, you can control freely which uh, loads uh, or which uh, lines should be uh, part of uh, which uh, load before you actually create them, because the the loads will not be created until you actually click this button up here. Then it will process and create all those loads for you. So if I do that, it will create a, a load for me with these two sales line on it. So if I go back to my load planning workbench, now I should have a, have a new uh, load ID over here with uh, two load lines on it. And that seems to be correct, yes. So now we're done with the load planning. Uh, that's uh, our first step here. Uh, so when it comes what it comes to next is the selection of the carrier. So you, uh, we are able to, uh, uh, as I told before, map carrier contracts to uh, uh, and rates to different carriers. But when we have done the load planning, we are able to uh, uh, go in and rate and route and see uh, which carrier should we select for this load. And this is also the part if you have a multimodal process uh, that will also be in place there. So you can create road guides and road plans, including uh, uh, multi-mode deliveries, and it will go through all of your road plans and find uh, if your loads, uh, if, if your load is consisting of multiple sales order going to different delivery others. There, it will find the right carriers that you specify there. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's uh, something we will not demo today. So. So the proposed load I showed before will uh, split into multiple loads if it exceeds the capacity. So then it will uh, create multiple loads. But you can also go into the load and do changes to it after it has been created. The only thing, uh, if you uh, split it out completely and the load is empty, then it will be deleted. So we cannot have any empty loads. That's one of the restrictions we have. But you can uh, change the uh, delete load lines from a load. So that's possible before they are picked. No, it does not. It does not. Uh, that's a, a feature we also have on the roadmap that we want to do. We have heard that before, uh, but the load sequence is not there with the, with packing into the truck, unfortunately. Uh, do you have a roadmap for considering the actual container, uh, like the package container weight instead of the uh, weight of the item? 
because that will be we have it on the roadmap no no because uh, when we do the packing mm -hmm. then, then uh, we are putting them into the box and then we weigh those boxes and then we enter those weights in, in uh, 22 I, I believe it's the same in uh, your version like yeah your yeah version. sure so we put the container um, and then we weigh them and then we enter them the actual weight so based yes. on that I, sh I want to calculate the actual crate but if the actual weight that you enter there on the container is updating the load lines, then that new weight will be used when you plan the transportation as well. All right, so that will be considered. If yes, yes, the yes. The if it's updated there on the pack station, yes, it well, will be considered. Yeah, exactly. All right, so that, that's what I was looking for. Yeah, I, I think it will do that. Okay. Yes? Uh, it can. We, ha we can put uh, item constraints um, in the TMS module as well, for especially for uh, uh, hazardous goods or if you use the uh, uh, SDCC codes or uh, any of those standard classification codes for items, uh, that's also possible to use. So you can put constraints that, you, uh, that a certain item that uh, uh, shouldn't go in a specific hub, for example. So the question is if it will bring, um, if we'll update the documentation and notes on the load uh, uh, that it is a dangerous goods. Uh, no, it will not be uh, uh, shown on the on the load, I believe, uh, because that's a product related. So it doesn't do hazardous goods, paperwork, and uh, oh. that it doesn't No, it, that, that's a different thing. If it, uh, for documentation and printing of a bill of lading, for example, contains the, that information with the SDC codes. Uh, so that's contained there. So I'll uh, continue with my flow. I, I'll try to remember where I was. <laughs> so now I'm in the load. <laughs> I go back to my load planning workbench. I can click here on rating and routing. And then I can uh, reach out to try to find a carrier. Uh, and here on the rate route workbench, it give, uh, when you do it from a load, already specified load, it has a from address and a to address. The from address is a warehouse and going out to our customer for it wholesale. So it fills in that information as well as the different data for weight and volume uh, in this case. So then it will also show our different carriers down here that we can select. Uh, and then if I assign, it will create a route uh, with that uh, with that uh, total rate on it. And then uh, once that is done and we've released it to warehouse and confirmed the, uh, and completed all the, the work and loaded it on the, on the truck, we can ship confirm uh, the load and then, it will, uh, and then it's also possible to print the documentation, for example, bill of lading or post a packing slip. Uh, and then it will, uh, at that point in time, also uh, create, uh, depending on your charges setup uh, that Frank will go through later, it will create a freight bill uh, uh, with that estimated cost, cost and move it to the source document line. Uh, does it have mindset to spot rate or is it more pre negotiated? So uh, it is possible, um, uh, so it's a uh, Pre negotiated. Pre negotiated yeah. on the most parts. It's possible to also do a third party integration to uh, a web service of the carriers. So that's also a possibility. And there it will uh, fetch the latest uh, rates from that carrier in that case. But we're not providing that integration out of box. We're just providing an example of how ten, that can be set up. And then you need to do, go the last mile of doing that. But that's a possibility as well. But for the most part, what we are demoing and uh, our uh, engines that I will talk about a bit later is uh, about mapping uh, pre-negotiated contracts uh, in your system and using only AX data for process processing those. Uh, yes, I'll quickly go through just to finish this uh, process. Uh, after you've confirmed, your shipment is out of the door. It's on the way to uh, your customer. And then maybe some while later you will receive a freight bill invoice from your carrier vendor with the price of the transportation. And you need to reconcile that with your estimated cost that you've uh, already assigned and put on the orders, the source documents. And that's where, where freight reconciliation comes in. We will go into, if we have time, uh, do a bit of demo of uh, how, how that works. Uh, and uh, if there is time, I will also show you how automated uh, freight bill matching works as well. 
uh, in TMS, we also have the possibility. I put it here a little bit on the outside because I don't, uh, I don't think I will show it today. Uh, but appointment scheduling is a possibility uh, that can also be used in driving uh, uh, warehousing uh, uh, put away to the bay doors, uh, where we, where the carriers can uh, check in, uh, or you can schedule a time for when the carrier is coming in, and then when they arrive at the uh, the specific bay door, they can uh, do a check-in and a check-out, so you can track how long it takes for them to load your trucks. Uh, so that's a possibility. Uh, so transportation charges. Uh, so next topic. Uh, so our pre-negotiated uh, contracts with carriers can be mapped in uh, many, many different ways. Uh, so we have a set of uh, transportation engines that we call them uh, that is basically different ways of calculating uh, rates or calculating different uh, different things in the TMS. Uh, so all, our, all all different carriers have uh, uh, different ways of uh, uh, how you want to be how they want to be charged for uh, for the freight. Uh, some some typical ones that we are usually demoing is the is, is the point to point mileage. For example, if you have a, uh, address A going out to address B, and you know there's a set of uh, uh, miles in between those two destinations, and you have a fixed charge per mile, for example, uh, from the carriers. Uh, so there are different calculations there. We have some documentation explaining each of them uh, and what they can be used for. Uh, what I will demo today is our n uh, new engine here, point to point by a volumetric weight. Uh, so what is volumetric weight? Uh, so shipping costs have traditionally been calculated on the basis of uh, gross weight uh, and in kilograms or in pounds by some carriers. I've included a link to Wikipedia. Uh, you can go in and check. This is a, a standard way of uh, calculating uh, freight charges from uh, some of the uh, bigger uh, uh, some of the bigger companies or transportation carriers like uh, UPS and FedEx or TNT. Uh, but by charging only by uh, the actual weight, some low-density products or packages can become uh, unprofitable for the transportation carriers to, uh, due to the amount of space that they actually take up in, in the truck, uh, even if they don't weigh a lot. So they've come up with a, a way to actually uh, charge a higher price based on the uh, volumetric weight, as they call it. They still charge by weight, but they are basing it on the on the on the theoretical weight that you get from uh, the volume of the package, uh, so we didn't have a support for this type of uh, rate cal calculation before, and that's what we added. Uh, so, uh, what I've shown here is uh, uh, an example of the setup. Uh, if I have a package that is um, uh, of these dimensions, 0 0.9, 0 0.4, 0 0.5, the volume will be uh, 0 0.18. Uh, and if we use a standard conversion factor, I think a, a DHL and FedEx use a conversion factor of 200, but that can differ between services and between um, different carriers as well. Uh, uh, and if you uh, multiply that uh, conversion factor with a volume, you get uh, a theoretical volumetric weight. Uh, so in this case, that would equal to 36. Uh, while in my example, uh, the actual weight of this package would be maybe uh, uh, three, three kilos instead. Uh, so they will charge for, uh, in, in that case, for, for the 36 instead of charging uh, uh, for the three kilos in, in that case. Uh, so our, huh. there we go, going back. Uh, so this um, uh, Rate engine is available with the fall release. Uh, we have two KB articles that are also released if you're on an earlier version. Uh, and the calculation is basically you get the total rate by uh, uh, having a, we, we specify the rate per uh, break interval so you can define different uh, uh, break intervals for uh, uh, what, uh, uh, for what inf intervals the, the max, uh, max weight should be calculated for. So we, it will be multiplied by either the actual weight. If the actual weight is higher than the volumetric weight, uh, then the actual weight will be used in the rate calculation instead. Uh, or it will uh, yeah, use the, that the volume factor times the volume to calculate the rate in that sense. Uh, so what we've done, I'll show a short demo. 
for uh, when you go to transportation manager management, go to your shipping carrier setup, uh, you will see for each service uh, we have added a, a new field called volume, volume factor that will only be used uh, by this new uh, transportation engine. So you can define different volume factors depending on the service that you are uh, have negotiated with your carrier. Uh, so that's also, if you're not familiar with the TMS, uh, we've defined it in that way that you create a shipping carrier that is, holds the overall uh, information of that carrier, and then you can create different uh, services depending if it's an express service or air or truck uh, that I have defined in this case. So you can create uh, multiple different services and uh, use different rate calculations for each service. And then in the rate profile, you define how uh, that rate should actually be done. Uh, so if I go to my rate master for this uh, carrier, I have uh, a few for for the air. And I think it might be this one. I can go to the rate base and define the, the different, uh, how, how, what the actual rate per, per rate unit uh, should be used. Uh, so I have uh, for this engine, I've created just uh, some different brake units depending on uh, depending on how much is on the loads. So I've created one for 100, 1,000, and 10,000, 20, and 5. And you can, doesn't look here that well here, but you can define uh, what should be the rate for each of these uh, different brakes. Uh, now I think I've, uh, I have made it pretty basic to only be... Uh, uh, the rate of one per uh, volume uh, to make it show in an easier way. Uh, so actually what it will do if I go back to my load, and actually I will use the same load as I had before. Oh, I think it's this one. And I'll reach up and we shall see if it was the right one. Yes, it was. You can see air cargo here, and that's using the new volumetric engine. Uh, so we will base the rates uh, on, the, on the used weight here. Uh, so actually, if I go up, I will see that the actual weight is only 15 for this load. But we have a volume of 0 0.9 that will be uh, multiplied by our volume factor, and that is 200. And then we can see that the, that the used weight down here, uh, that's, the, that's the total or the highest amount. If the actual weight is higher, this one will use the actual weight. But if the, but if the volume, volumetric weight is higher than the actual weight, then that value will be used for calculating the freight. Uh, so that's what's shown here in that field. So if I actually go up and make a change here, so I say that the uh, just for uh, showing that the actual weight is 200, if I rate shop again, uh, you will see that the use weight has changed to using that field instead for calculating the rate. So we'll use either or. I can change that back. I'm not sure what it was. 15, maybe. Doesn't matter. Uh, so that's basically how that engine works. And now I can assign uh, this carrier for, for use of that. And then we get the, the rate assigned to, uh, to that load. And that sums up the demo of volumetric weight. OK. Thank you. So. What I will be presenting you uh, with here is how um, different charges, freights uh, from uh, within the system, from how they are coming from transportation, uh, in some cases can be accounted as cost for your products. Um, as the basis of that, we have in the system at this very core, the concept of charge codes. Um, charge codes is where you're defining how you are driving your accounting. I'll show you in a moment. 
In addition to that, we have a concept of charge codes, or sorry, charge categories. Charge categories are something that is getting specified once you are having a charge and applying it to a document. And options available in context of the transportation management are fixed and proportional. And proportional currently is only available on uh, purchase orders. And I'll actually show you how uh, we have applied a proportional charge and the impact of uh, that. And then finally, the setup that connects charge codes with how it's been used in the transportation management is one that's done in a form called miscellaneous charges. And uh, here we have a setup where different types of source documents each have their own category, so to speak, that are getting used. For sales orders, we have a category of customers, purchase order vendors, and what we will also be showing you is with transfer orders that we now have a category of inventory that can be applied with transfer orders. So looking at that, I will be showing you uh, charts codes. And charts codes, as they are defined in the system, includes um, how you want to drive your accounting. And they're a debit side and a credit side, very basic to accounting. Um, but in addition to that, we're also specifying a type of accounting we're doing. And notice this particular one here, I don't know if you're able to see, but on the debit side it's reading item. This means that this chart is going to be attributing to the inventory costs. Um, and this is one that you can be using in context of purchase orders. So like when you're receiving something, then the charts can be added atop of the purchase price. Uh, for a type of a landing cost that will then capitalize as inventory. On the credit side, so that's one option to, to, to say that it's attributing to, uh, to the cost. There's also other options available here, in particular the ledger account. If you're not intending for that this chart needs to be going into inventory, but you just want to see an accounting impact of this chart, Consider, for instance, that you have a carrier invoice, the expense going in somewhere, and you want to track in your accounting how you would be activating part of that cost, adhering it to documents, so to speak. You may actually be pulling that amount off by using a ledger account um, in that case, or tracking it as an expense directly, if you like. Uh, that's possible, too. So that's an alternative to the item. On the offsetting side, you would have the option, again, of specifying a ledger account or a custom and vendor. Um, let's take the custom and vendor. This is in context of that view. Let's take the purchase order. If you're specifying this, then it essentially means that you are adding a charge that is one that is getting invoiced from the vendor. So it's adding to the invoice total in that case. Similar if you are using a charge with the charge codes configured so that it's specifying also again the, the customer vendor, it means that it's a charge you're billing the customer. It's adding to the invoice total. That seen uh, as with an alternative of that you instead are using Ledger, Ledger would account the charts in parallel to the document then without adding it to the invoice in that case. So when we are looking at TMS, you would quite likely be looking at not having that these are invoices that are getting built on the purchase order. It would commonly be that the invoicing that we're having for that charge is with the, is with the carrier. So there is where you're recording the, the charge, and then essentially you'll be using the ledger to offset from that 
and then potentially with the uh, purchase order be having a debit going into inventory if that's what you're intending or having two ledger accounts where you're activating in your, in your ledger. For sales orders, you definitely can have for transpo, uh, tra uh, transportation management that you are applying charges that you want to be billing. So there you can be using the, uh, the customer as, a, as, a, as an option here. Right. So in, in this case, you, you'd need to be using different charge codes to differentiate for those scenarios. Um, how that would work into your scenario depends on many, de <laughs> many details in that case. But, but yeah, okay. differentiation within charge codes are, uh, is not available. Right. Yeah. When you talk about ledger account or vendor customer item. Yes. It's not as such accounting dimensions. It's more a matter of how those accounting entries are getting handled. If, if, if it's item, then it would actually assign that charge and put a top of the costs that goes into inventory. And accounting indirectly then would feed from the costs. So when we are posting what is going into the ledger, it would be a sum of the charge amount and the purchase amount line amount of the purchase order. So it's a little bit different from that. So it's bumping up the purchase order cost to the right? Essentially. Percent. Essentially, yes. Yeah, yeah. Let me show you that actually in a moment because I have a sample where I'll show you a purchase order that we have been posting according to that so we could get a sense uh, to that point. Right. So I'll jump into the miscellaneous charges form. Uh, this is the form. Are you ashamed of that? Ah. the same issue also in the new version. I'll jump out to it if you have started. If I have a change that, that basically if I'm trying to navigate away from something, it will save uh, so that you don't need to... If you're forgetting explicitly saving, which you shouldn't need to, then it will try to do it for you. Yeah. No, it's fine. Yeah. Yeah. So I'll jump into the miscellaneous charts form, and this is, as I said early on, where we're connecting how we are accounting by the charge codes into how it's getting used in the transportation management. And as I was sharing, we had different charts modules that exist um, to be used with different types of, of uh, documents, customer for sales orders, vendor is, is where it's getting used for, for purchase order, and inventory is, is what uh, we'd be showing you on, um, on transfer orders. Um, and just to show you the one that we are using on the, um, on the purchase order is, in fact, one with item as the debit, so an example to where we're adding to the... Um, inventory value. It's offsetting, it's sitting on ledger in this particular one, which is um, common when uh, we'd be using it from uh, transportation management because, again, we are, we are, it's an expense inferred by the carrier, not from the material purchase itself. So, I have a purchase order that we prepared that I'll be looking up here. And this one has already been received. So we are uh, jumping ahead of those uh, steps that exist. The line price on this particular purchase order is, is 2,400. If I'm looking on the financials, 
to see what kind of charges has been assigned to this particular one. Um, then we have a charge here that was assigned from the transportation management. Um, notice here it's the same charge code as is showed from the miscellaneous charge form. It has been assigned using the category of proportional. That proportional category was again one from the miscellaneous charge or specified that in that grid as well uh, for this particular amount. Now, what does proportional mean in context uh, in, in comparison to fixed? Proportional is a charge category that allow for four purchase orders to post the amount of the charge order already at the time where you're receiving goods. And later when you're doing the invoicing, it would adjust if any adjustment has come into the charge. So what it allows for is that we can basically post this charge amount at the time of receipt, add the value of this into our inventory cost already at that time, and then at the invoice, if there are any slight adjustments to the charge, then it would adjust the, the, the cost accordingly. So if you're in comparison using the fixed, then it would only account the charge with the invoice, not the receipt. And you can imagine the impact of that. You'll be receiving goods to the line amount only at a lower cost, and then later at the invoice, the cost will go up, adding the charts at that time. So it kind of eliminates that flux in the cost that exists. This proportion is based on the value, not based on the volume, right? The proportional part is based actually on the quantity. Because the thing is, if you are having an order line with a total charge assigned, and you are receiving, say, a third of the quantity, then it would take a third of the amount of the charge and assign its cost at that time. But so that not look at the volume part. It's not a volume based. It is. It is saying that full line will have a cost of of a total amount, and it will then distribute that evenly as you're having receipts on the order line. And it's 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 representing the full ordered amount, in this case. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yep. So that's handled in uh, in our TMS in our generic apportionment engine. So you can specify an apportionment engine to either do by weight, by volume, or by pieces. So you can change that depending on your process and how you want to apportion it uh, to the different lines. But that is handled in the in TMS. So it's in. So it's possible to do by volume. Yes. It's, 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 it's important to realize that the calculation of the, the rate with the carrier is at a load level. One load may service multiple documents. And that's where the apportionment comes in, that you look at the total amount that you will become due for the carrier, and then you split it out or apportion it out to the different lines getting serviced by the carrier. And that can then be done by these different uh, bases. Yes. Yeah. Yes, it is. So I'm looking at the product receipt journal here in this particular case, and I'm looking at the line, and this one line here uh, is, is what we're seeing uh, that was uh, posted. Charges here uh, that were signed at the product receipt can also be shown here for historic purposes. And uh, note we have a charge of uh, 1,220. And we had the line amount of 2,400. So I can actually be reviewing my inventory transactions related to this particular one and uh, look at transaction details. And on the transaction details, you'll notice that the, uh, that the amount, the cost that was acknowledged as inventory would be the sum of these two. Now I was receiving the full amount, so there's no proportional part here. The proportional category just ensures that you're posting it with the receipt uh, in, in this particular example. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So from that, we'll be looking a bit into uh, reconciliation of uh, transfer orders, and um, which is something new that we have been enabling. Um, I'll just bring you back to the miscellaneous charts form um, and again point to this new 
category or module that were added where you can now add uh, charges to that one. Um, a couple of things to pay notice to here is the charge code you can be assigning and using under this inventory module is limited only to charges that are set up as ledger to ledger. Under some ideal, more ideal circumstances, we might have been able to account inventory markup, inventory value uh, that are increased as part of the transfer. We are not supporting that at this point of time. Um, so it, it might set up, I, uh, I keep my costing level at the warehouse. You know, I, there's a setup in the module. Do I enable the costing at the warehouse level? Then it still it will not uh, like increase the cost? It will not. It will, it will simply, it, it is not, it is not. Um, the objective of what we've been doing was to enable the freight reconciliation with these types of source document, not the cost part of it. Uh, the, the, the cost is still a valid request, only one we haven't come to at this point of time. Um, I, would, I, would, I would share with you that it has some implications of enabling this scenario because we are having some behavior in our inventory module, specifically inventory closing, where you're moving between warehouses where we have some optimizations in place, where if you're moving between uh, non-financial uh, uh, transactions or, or warehouses uh, in this case, that we are essentially eliminating those transactions from, from closing, and that would violate that to enable this. So um, there's a fair amount of work involved in, in enabling this, and we're not there at this time. So just to level set on what we have done and what not, again, focused on the freight reconciliation only. So I thought, Manus, could you take us through a transfer yeah. order? Yes. An example? I'll see if we, we do have one slide. Now that's the, okay. Freight reconciliation, transfer order. Okay, the transfer order, and create the freight bill, and then we'll go through the freight reconciliation process. Mm -hmm. So I can go to, we have, you've seen already. I, the actually, as yes, there were so many uh, uh, not too familiar with the, um, with the TMS, maybe it's, it's, it's good to do this uh, now, actually. Mm. I had it here. So let me speak to that just briefly. The freight reconciliation process, just to, to, to capture that um, at a high level, um, you saw Marcus explain how we are calculating um, a, a rate up front, a charge, um, from whatever agreements we are representing by the carriers, um, from the service that, that we are enabling, and the engine going behind, allowing for different ranges of calculation bases that are getting used. What happens then is that this in turns are assigned with a load as a freight bill, including then that what may be a theoretical type of charge that uh, exists. And again, this is for the load that may be a uh, servicing multiple uh, orders. Subsequently, the carrier will be invoicing for their service. And that invoice potentially may be one that are getting uh, loaded into the system uh, or into it manually. Uh, we are having support for that you can actually create the freight invoice as a basis of the freight bill. So for those examples where you're able to accurately represent what the carrier will be billing and even that they allow for that we bill on their behalf, then you can simply create the invoice on behalf of the freight bill and uh, post there without having to do anything more than that. But for those cases where we have the theoretical cost of the charge on the freight bill and the freight invoice, they may not fully match. And that's where the reconciliation come in, that you're looking to match up between the two. And if there's any bias between these, that essentially you need to then uh, determine what do you do with that bias. And here there are different reasons that you can be applying that will then have different effects as to how the accounting will, will happen there too. Ultimately, once you have gone through that reconciliation, you're looking for posting the invoice with those extensions that you made with those uh, biases or, or differences that was 
um, uh, guided by the recent codes. And that will then be posted in uh, using ledger journals, and it goes into the uh, general journal from there. Going back to the freight bill, different source documents um, will have the charge allocated to these by apportionment engines, what we spoke of before. The total charge on the load will then be distributed down to the source documents, sales orders, purchase orders, that, or transfer orders that are getting used in this context. And there can then be the different bases for how that distribution is happening. That's where the apportionment engines uh, help define that, uh, that basis. Yeah? So what we have done on the transfer order is essentially enable the, uh, the reconciliation of, um, of the carrier invoice uh, with freight bills. Um, and there was a bit, um, a few things that needed to be added. Obviously, this new inventory module type of, of uh, charge on the miscellaneous charges I showed you um, will enable that uh, the engines will be calculating a charge for these types of loads, assigning to the freight bill, and that by the apportionment that it will distribute down and create charges on transporters. So you see in transfer orders that charges will start being recorded there. And that, in case, enables for that the carrier invoice reconciliation can do the comparison with those documents and do the reconciliation uh, through that basis. And as I shared, um, we are not accounting cost. Actually, beyond that, the charges that are put on the uh, transfer orders we will not even generate journal entries. So, no, not even with this. Not even with this. The charges are put under trend for orders solely for that purpose to help the reconciliation uh, from the theoretical charge and the actual charge represented by the carry invoice. I mean, we were not able to at this time to post with the uh, adding to inventory. There are more pieces to it as well because we would need to be considering when are you potentially adding a cost, what events are this, who is actually the one upholding cost, the shipping end, the receiving end, you know, those type of variants. And we are not currently at a state where we have added support for that. So just to level set, it is not intending for driving the accounting of this, uh, these charges on the transfer orders. They serve the purpose of enabling uh, the reconciliation of the carry in was at this time. So then we are defining the charge code for the transfer order. Yep. So you said we will only define ledger on both sides. Correct. So where those ledgers will be used? They will not be used. It will not be used. They will not, they will not account on these at this time. So we just put any like dummy because it's for now, for now that would suffice. Yes. It's a requirement to create a miscellaneous charge. We need to define the debit and credit. Correct. Correct. So we just put a dummy account. For Correct. Them. Correct. At this time you would you may consider applying some charges if you're building reports and what have you that can, can calculate those uh, um, amounts and breaking out by the account, but it doesn't have a ledger impact at this time. Would be the case, yes, yes. Yeah. That's, that's, where we are, that's, that's where we are going with this, that the reconciliation between, as we were talking about, the predetermined type of charge and what we're getting in more is that we can facilitate that process and you can go through that reconciliation. You can assess if, if, if actually that you are getting in more is, is the right charge or they are billing us for something they shouldn't be doing. Uh, so take your own internal freight audit process. Kind of. Yes, you're right. You're also correct. Back. Potentially, yeah, potentially, yes. Okay, so this reconciliation process is not limited to the transfer order, right? Because we will have the freight... No, 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 no. 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 It, it, it used to exist for sales and purchase orders. What we have done here is enable it also for the transfer order. So it works That's exactly the, the same for both uh, sales and purchase orders as well. Yeah. But I will uh, do a demonstration on the transfer order. So in, in case 
case of purchase order, if there is any deviation, then we can update that and it will automatically update my purchase order invoice. Uh, after the invoice is done. After the, the, the invoice for the, 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 material, the purchase order where you are procuring material uh, has been invoiced, it would not retroactively adjust the charge on that one. It would expense only. Okay. If in my code, sorry, yeah. if in my uh, charge code I have defined the uh, item on yes. one side mm -hmm. and uh, the customer slash vendor on the other side, yep. like how will it book the expense? Because my debit is supposed to be the item which should impact my inventory. The, the, the charge amount you are having posted on the PO would not be adjusted. It will not be adjusted. No. Not, not, if, not if the invoice has been, been posted already, that, that PO. Then it would not adjust the charge anymore, which means that if you have a bias that you are recording, then it would just be a matter of how to handle the billing with your carrier. And you would have an expense not um, allocated towards a material purchase in that case. Yeah. yeah. But it's a, it's, it's, it's... Correct, correct. I mean, it's a good and valid point, one that uh, definitely is, is one we'd like to get to at some point, yeah. yeah. Can you back up for just one second? Earlier we got into discussion on where we was doing the, uh, it felt like on a PO line we got quantities out there, and we expect so much freight for that quantity, but mm -hmm. they not all came in on one PO. Then we got into the separate conversation about, well, this freight order may have lots of different products on it. Mm -hmm. So all that does gear together and work together for good mm -hmm. at the end of the day, is that right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it does. And the correlation between those freight orders and the expense that are carried with that is then split out to each one of those material orders mm -hmm. by this apportionment that exists. It almost feels like a little bit, I'm speaking to myself, we're kind of doing due diligence about where you got all this right and whatever, but I mean, obviously you're working with somebody to dial this in so that the freight audit process is really productive, automated, better than what a human auditor could do. So you, you just got to get everything all lined up and get it working. Is that right? And sure. I, I would not make the claim that it's perfect. <laughs> it, it may not be, uh, but but uh, but uh, it covers the basis at, at least, and we have multiple companies using this on an everyday basis, uh, the way it's working right now. And they're having better luck than what a human freight auditor might be. Uh, you, you should direct that question to them on, <laughs> on how they stack up. Yeah. No, no problem. That's a problem. No problem. Um, so I'll have, I have a created uh, transport over here going from warehouse 24 to warehouse 51. So it's in a created state. I haven't done anything more than adding one uh, line for 20 pieces of A001 to it. Uh, and what we can do from here, uh, we can go to the ship part and go to the load planning workbench for this transfer order. And then we'll uh, uh, filter out on this uh, transfer line that we have here that is available for shipment. So I can add that to a new load. I'll add a load template ID, 40 feet container. That's okay. Plenty of room. So I'll create the load for that one. And now we want to do the uh, select, select a carrier for uh, shipping this. Uh, so I'll reach up. I think we only have one carrier going this direction. Uh, another thing that is important to do for uh, transfer orders is to define the delivery terms. The delivery terms need to be enabled to uh, add transportation costs. So that's a very important note because uh, when you create a transfer order, it will not uh, automatically populate uh, a delivery term. So you need to do that also. Uh, so here I see... Uh, On the delivery terms, there's a check mark that governs whether charges are getting allocated. Mm. Think in terms of that, you know, depending on who is the one carrying the expense, that you would uh, define that there. So that's why it's important. So I'll assign this carrier to the load, and it will create a route for this transfer order. So now we have uh, planned the transportation and assign a carrier to this uh, uh, <coughs> Transfer I can go back to the load planning workbench, and now we want to uh, release this load to the warehouse. Uh, so we create the warehouse work. So I'll do that process in order for us to be able to uh, do confirm the shipment, and when the shipment is confirmed, that is when the freight bill will be created uh, and uh, the cost allocated to the lines. So I'll need to complete that process as well. Uh, 
So I'll go and check how our work is doing, our warehouse work. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with uh, our warehousing module in detail, uh, I'll need to pick this item from uh, its inventory location and put it at the bay door where, uh, uh, where the truck is located. So, so I'll do that using our uh, uh, mobile app. I'll sign in with my warehouse ID. And I was already, I'm a diligent warehouse worker, I'm doing many things. Uh, so I, I'm going to do a transfer pick. I'll scan the work ID that we have for this work. And so it asked me to pick uh, these items that are not on a uh, license plate control location. I'll need to assign a, a target license plate for my truck. This is just a, a standard uh, pick from the, from the warehouse management. Uh, and now we're putting this at the bay door. Uh, and when that is completed, uh, work is completed, I can see that uh, uh, our warehouse work has now uh, been closed. And if I go back to the load and uh, refresh, you will see the load status has changed to loaded. That means that the load is ready to uh, leave the warehouse. So if I do my ship confirmation at this point in time, uh, what it actually also will do uh, that you might not know is that it will uh, re-rate uh, the shipping carrier as well. So if you've done changes uh, to your uh, uh, transportation negotiation, in the meantime, after you've uh, planned and when you ship it out, it will uh, do those uh, recalculation to find the latest rate for your shipment. Uh, so that will happen when you ship confirm. So when I confirm this outbound shipment, it will also uh, post the freight bill. Uh, so now you can see the load status is shipped. And if I go to related information and check the freight bill details, uh, I will find that uh, the rate that I've selected is applied. So if I go back to my transfer order uh, from here, I can also, if I refresh here, uh, you see those are no, no longer available. Uh, I can find here in my, uh, it's actually in the charges. If I click there, I also find the transportation uh, cost added to the line of the uh, transfer order. So obviously this is a simple example. We are creating a dedicated load for this one document. So the apportionment is a one-to-one -one in this case. Uh, so now that we have the freight bill, we can start the freight reconciliation process, which doesn't differ from if you do it from a sales order or from a purchase order. That's the same, same process and the same steps. So I'll walk through that. Uh, I need to go to my load again and find my freight bill. And from the freight bill details, we have the option to generate uh, uh, the freight bill invoice from the carrier uh, and base it off of this uh, um, of this freight bill that we have. So if you want to do that manually. Yeah. So I'll do that. I'll assign it an uh, invoice number. And then it will take me to uh, the matching screen uh, where we can match up uh, uh, the freight. Or it take me first to the details of the freight invoice, and then we can do the matching. So for example. So, so here we generated the freight invoice according to the freight bill. Mm -hmm. Um, as opposed to this getting in manually. Uh, and we can go in and actually edit uh, the invoice as well. So if I go over here, I can change the amounts. So if I do that, for example, let's say our freight carrier is charging us 30 extra for this freight. I can save the invoice. And then when I do my matching, uh, now I'm going to do the manual process of doing the freight reconciliation. Freight reconciliation. It's also possible if you have a, um, a lot of these to automate that process. So we have batch shops uh, that can go through that as well. Uh, so now we are in the matching screen. Uh, what I see here is the invoice header. I see the details of the invoice. And then down below, I see all the unmatched freight bills that I have available uh, that have not been matched to, uh, to one of the invoices. So I'll need to find the correct one. That's pretty easy because I see that the other one are in a, have a very high rate compared to this one. So I can select that and click match. And it will move that line up to this uh, 
place with match freight bill details. So for example, if you have uh, uh, multiple freight bills that have been split up, uh, uh, depending on your, uh, uh, because you have multiple source document lines or multiple source documents there, you can uh, match uh, all those different freight bills up to one invoice. So for those cases where the freight carrier uh, sends you one invoice containing many shipments. Uh, so that's a possibility there. Do you deal with milk runs? Yes, we do. So we have a process uh, for uh, creating scheduled routes uh, that we can use for milk runs as well. It's been an area we didn't really dive into how you can do route planning and that. Uh, no. Exactly. But, yeah. And then what about if these different uh, pickups or plants that have to be different legal entities or companies? Mm -hmm. No, so the, no, not at this time. No. no. The milk run currently works only for sales orders, as it is right now. And, and confined into one legal entity at yes. a time. Yes. Yeah. yeah. It's not a shared, shared process uh, across now no. at this time. No. Yeah. They are not, not yet posted. So first we do the matching. Yes, first. If there's a discrepancy, we can go back to the supplier, do the amendment, come back, update. Exactly. So that's a possibility. So when I click uh, submit for approval, now that I match them, it will figure out that we have a, a discrepancy of uh, 30 US dollars for this uh, for this freight bill because uh, we were charged more from the carrier. And what we can do here is that we can select different uh, reconciliation reason codes uh, uh, depending on what we want to happen here. So do we want to pay uh, pay the extra amount, approve it, and pay it through the freight invoice, uh, we can select that. Or if we want to uh, uh, do something else or define a different credit account where we want to uh, pull, put that uh, discrepancy to, uh, that's a possibility as well. So I'll just approve this one for now, because uh, yes, we should pay our carriers, even if they're overcharging us. I'll click OK. So when we do automatic matching, uh, it's possible to create a, or to define tolerance levels that you would uh, auto-approve uh, based upon. So if you set it up to perhaps 5% tolerance rel, uh, uh, level, then if it goes to, uh, above 5% uh, in discrepancy, it will not auto-approve those freight bills. But if it's within that tolerance level, it will. I'm talking about a scenario where it is not about approved, like it's more than 5%. Mm -hmm. How you could delegate them in different ways according to the that that uh, discrepancy, yes. So it's like a standard workflow, like I can Yeah, there's behind, yeah. And after we've done the matching and submitting it, we can uh, again view the details of uh, what was uh, the decision taking at that point in time. Uh, and now if I Go back to the, here we go, to the freight invoice detail. I'll refresh this one, and it will hide because it's approved. If I want to show that one again, and now I can use this to get to the vendor invoice journal that was created at this point in time. Uh, and in the, and from there you can drill into the, uh, the financials of that. So here we see we have a vendor invoice created, a vendor invoice journal created for that. So that's the basics of how our uh, uh, freight reconciliation works. Uh, Essentially, the steps you've just been seeing are exactly the same as we have it, for instance, with a sales order process. The same type of interaction you can do, only shown now in context of transfer orders that you can take it all the way through the reconciliation process. Um, so it may have been a little bit fast we covered this, but the, the structure and the flow of this match up on the sales owner, if you're familiar with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I'll go back here. Uh, we have a feedback session uh, tomorrow at 3.15 as well. Uh, if you have a 
another questions you figure out late in the night, oh, I should have asked this, you can join the session and uh, have all your questions answered. We'll be there for yes. that. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. If I have like a mixture of warehouse, like one warehouse with WMS and another one is like a small warehouse, over there I can use the... It's on the roadmap uh, to enable also using TMS with non-warehouse management and enabled. But it's, yeah, it's uh, in the roadmap. We know what we need to do there, but it, uh, it's not enabled uh, today. Not time bound to this. No. No. So it uh, depends on uh, your feedback as well. If you have customers requesting that, we will uh, bump it up. That's the way it works. Yeah. Yeah. That was pretty much it. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> if there are any questions, you're welcome to approach us. Uh, we can take them now. You're also welcome to attend the the feedback loop we're having tomorrow.